after a lovely lunch and great uh, conversation and a very lively earlier session and so on. So, so I'm, I'm looking forward to an equally robust engagement uh, in this session. And it seems like people have, have still got the energy for it, so that's great. My name is Christy van der Westhuizen. I'm with the Center for the Advancement of Non-Racialism and Democracy here at Nelson Mandela University. Um, <clears throat> thanks for inviting me to participate and, and to be part of what's been so far really a fascinating um, conversation. And I'm, and I'm also happy to see how we've been willing to go to, to the more difficult places as well, but in a very uh, convivial um, spirit, which is also great. So, um, so we've heard quite a bit on the university uh, from various angles. Um, in this session specifically, we are looking at the meaning of African in the African university. And the question is, does or can it facilitate an African emancipatory imagination? And we've got three stupendous colleagues who will be able to help us to think this through. Vivian Bozalek, Amos Ngujani, Njugu, uh, sorry, Njuguna, sorry, and uh, Michael Ukcherefo. So, but I'm going to just make a few introductory comments. Um, just wanting to pause firstly at the term African itself, which uh, particularly in the South African context uh, is, is a highly contested term. The question of course is who is African? and whether we move from a narrow or a more expansive um, understanding. And the term, of course, year in South Africa is particularly fraught because of this being a settler society, which um, if we f uh, follow somebody like Yuval Davis, is a society in which Europeans have settled and established dominance over indigenous people with the resultant heterogeneous society in terms of class, race, and ethnicity. Now, South Africa's misfortune has been to have been, um, in fact, subjected to not one but two uh, settler classes. Of course, white political domination was finally ended, but as we know, and people have been speaking about um, colonialities, um, still we have white economic and cultural preeminence, both uh, still continuing into the democratic era. So in this heterogeneous space, African as among others, also become a site of racial um, contestation. If we look at our, our legislation that we've put, been putting in place since the uh, mid-1990s, uh, for example, our em Employment Equity Act and so on, um, the term black is used to refer to everybody that's positioned, and uh, that was positioned as racially other to the whites under colonialism and apartheid. So black, therefore, encompasses coloreds, Indians, and Africans as these as the three categories as they, as they are identified now in the democratic era. Um, apart from the contestation around black, from time to time questions arise in the public discourse here around whether not all South Africans are indeed African. Um, so Tal Mbeki, of course, who might sound like a, sounds like a blast from the past, but um, Tal Mbeki is somebody who um, has engaged with this question way back in the mid-90s in his I'm an African address, in which he proposed a more expansive uh, understanding of, of, of African. But we have, we, this, it's very fraught, because uh, we know as well that the Afrikaner nationalists identified um, and still identify the remnants that, that remain as also as, as African, but for a different purpose. And in, and in this case, the purpose is specifically to um, to confirm their settler claims to belonging in the space and to confirm their, their claim to the land, you know. So, um, uh, and, uh, you know, and this continues into, into the present day. So for some South Africans, on the other hand, um, it's a term of inclusion that indicates the belonging of all. Um, and then in contrast, we have also seen some recent essentialist discourses where the term is claimed only for certain people, usually along with the term black, excluding those who were classified under apartheid categories as white, Indian, and colored. So one can see there's a lot of different political contestations um, going on. Then there's, of course, the question of South Africa's relationship with the rest of the African continent. And uh, much has been written on South African exceptionalism, which is partly a condition in which South Africans see themselves as different 
if not superior to, to the rest of the continent. Just anecdotally, when one engages with, with, um, uh, with colleagues from the rest of the continent, um, there's usually a frustration and irritation with both white and black South Africans um, and their attitudes uh, towards other Africans in their interactions. And of course, we know the blight of xenophobia sits also upon us as, as South Africans with violent and murderous attacks on Africans from other parts of the continent increasing um, over the past decade or so. Um, and of course, all these complexities are playing out in our education space. If we just think of the Mahmoud Mandani case in the mid-1990s uh, at UCT, I see he's in, t in the meantime he's been appointed actually at UCT, so it seems like they've kissed and made up. But um, basically, um, at the time, he was tasked with developing an African studies curriculum, and which was then rejected by, by the specific uh, committee, or the relevant committee, and, and he then um, uh, left shortly after that. And, and wrote also on this question of a South African parochialism when it comes to engaging with the rest of, of the, of the content, uh, continent, but also with knowledges from this, this continent. Ashil Mbembe more recently has spoken about what he calls the provincialism of South African universities, uh, you know, along the same um, vein, uh, a lack of knowledge about also about the history and the histories of the, of the continent. Uh, also uh, in relation to the university on, on the African continent. So just in terms of a few personal reflections um, uh, in the research funding and education process that I've been involved in, both black and white colleagues uh, rejected my suggestion that collaboration with other African universities on the continent should be favor favorably considered um, along with other factors in deciding who gets funding and who doesn't. So collaborations, um, partnerships with other universities on the African continent, and there was quite a bit of disquiet about the suggestion from, from our side. Um, um, uh, and and, and yeah, colleagues just um, were completely opposed to it. So uh, in my previous job at the University of Pretoria, we had a, a university-wide curriculum transformation process where yet again the question of African and Africanization um, you know, came up, of course, as part of that. And again, there was quite a bit of um, resistance to the idea of, of bringing in the African con context, you know, um, as part of, you know, the way that we have to be transforming and decolonizing our curricula. And there was an, uh, uh, basically an implicit su suggestion in the conversations that we were having that it would sort of amount to a lowering of standards, basically, that we are basically somehow saying that, that, that our curricula will, be, will not be at... At, at world standards, but of course we know that that world standard actually just refers to the, the global north. Uh, the, the notion of South-South collaboration also doesn't feature, it's sort of when you try to engage with people around that, it doesn't seem to be a political, a political understanding about that, and the focus is firmly on the global north, <clears throat> which as we know is a hangover from the apartheid and colonial eras, and this is being exacerbated now by increasing anxieties to be part of the global ranking scramble, and this also involves, in some cases then, uh, the reorientation of research to goals to align with Global North agendas. So you, you're seeing, sort of in the face of the impetus towards decolonization, you're seeing um, actually a kind of a self-imposed recolonization that's happening at some of our, our universities. So um, yesterday there was some reference to responsiveness to local context combined with a global orientation, so that local global connection. Um, and for me, relevance to the African context and responsiveness, uh, you know, become a key concern in terms of thinking and doing at South African universities that would determine whether they are indeed African. So these contestations around inclusion and exclusion amid continuing col colonialities need to be taken into account if we want to make sense of an African university with a view to advancing a, an emancipatory imagination. So with those few words, let me hand over to our panel members. You will each have five to seven minutes, and then we'll jump into um, a discussion with our floor. Hello. Hello. Is the mic working? Hello? I think it's working now. Okay, I'm going to jump straight into it because I have very little time. In considering the African university, 
I find it useful to think with someone like Mahmoud Mamdani. He looks at the African university historically and reminds us that the current African university draws its inspiration from the colonial period, using as a model, and I quote, a discipline-based gated community that maintained a distinction between clearly defined groups, administrators, academics, and fee-paying students. This model was based on the 19th century Humboldt University founded in Berlin in 1810. The African University made its appearance later in the early 20th century with Southern African universities like Cape Town, um, Stellenbosch being started by Utrecht University in the Netherlands, Cape Town and Witz, and in the north, institutions which were already existing like El Azhar in Cairo, an Islamic center of scholarship being expanded and modernized by including more disciplines. The Humboldt model saw education at the university as guided by academic inquiry, reason, the spirit of truth, and academic argument. In this way, Humboldtian University sought to develop <coughs> universal scholars who stood for these things, regardless of context. And so the African University began as part of the European colonial mission. As Mamdani puts it, and I quote, a precursor of the one-size-fits-all initiatives that we associate with the World Bank and the IMF, until this was challenged by decolonization. The first challenge to this one-size-fits-all model started to emerge after the Second World War from nationalist movements who put forward the importance of being a committed intellectual, concerned with relevance and politics of their own societies, rather than excellence as promoted by the idea of a universal scholar. Mamdani explains at length the development of a reform <coughs> movement in the 1960s, which took place on what he sees as two very different campuses. The university he now works at, Makarere in Kampala, founded 40 years before Uganda's independence in 1922, and Dar es Salaam, founded when Tanganyika became independent in 1961. Makarere was developed exactly in the mold of the conservative universalist European colonial university, whereas Dar, as an affiliate of the University of London, became seen as the home of the African public intellectual, a flag bearer of the anti-colonial nationalism. Each was proud of their reputations and defended their positions, exemplified by two particular scholars who e embodied these different approaches. Ali Mazru, a professor at Makarere who strongly believed in the classical Humboldtian model of scholarship and ideas, and Walter Rodney from, from SOAS, who saw the university as a place of activism where knowledge should be constructed in the here and now. Such debates were held in the magazine Transition, started in Kampala by Rajat Nioji. Um, and literary figures like James Baldwin, Chinua Chebe, Wali Soinka, and Gugi Wationgo, as well as South African writers like Nadine Bordema, Esikum Patlele, Dennis Brutus, and Lewis and Corsi contributed to this publication, which became part of a widening regional discussion, including Julius Nerere, who published a defense of the one-party system, and Kenneth Kaunda on the future of democracy in Africa at the time of them becoming presidents of Tanzania and Kenya in the 1960s. The two universities, Makarere and Dar, continued their distinctive paths. Reformers at Makarere were concerned with deracializing the teaching body, which was largely white, whereas at Dar it was the relevance of the curriculum that was being called into question the university's administrative structure and the need for interdisciplinary scholarship, particularly in relation to the country's socioeconomic and political issues. Besides South Africa, Egypt, and Northern Africa, the spread of higher education in Africa generally happened with independence and became a hallmark of it. For example, in Nigeria, there was only one university in the colonial period, and after 1990, there were 31 <coughs> universities. In the 1970s, the fiscal crisis in Africa and the intervention of the IMF changed the University of Makerere and other universities in the region. 
individuals had to pay fees and the curriculum became more market oriented like geography, offering tourism or linguistics, a BA in secretarial studies. Mamdani asks whether there is an intellectual mode of reasoning that we call African in the same way as there's a French or Western reasoning. He sees language as an issue mitigating against this as the pro proliferation of 700 languages in Africa, which are not used at university formally, with the exception of Afrikaans, of course. It is the, lang the colonial languages in the sciences, law, etc., that are used. This makes the African university today still framed by univers er, European universalism as a colonial project, where many are either excluded or m not made to feel at home or welcome there as we've heard in the workshop yesterday and today. As Africans, we also need to claim the space of elaboration of theories in our own context, rather than to be research subjects or data to be appropriated by the global north. The local production of knowledge is important, and I agree with Mamdani when he argues that we need to find the right balance between local and global in theorizing our realities. We also need to think about how some knowledges have been discarded and others have attained the status of knowledge. It's possible to find generative ways of reading different theories through each other to come to new understandings as committed intellectuals in a continuing conversation beyond disciplinarity, institutional, national, and international boundaries, and to subvert settled notions of knowledge. To think otherwise, as um, Fred Moten would say, in the elsewhere, to address contemporary contextual and political issues. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Amos. Uh, thank you for the invite. Uh, as I thought about this topic and thinking what exactly is African within the African University? I think two quick, two quick questions came into my mind and as I prepared on, on this. And the first one is basically, why does the university exist? And then the question on where? Then this brought me to some quick thinking. Is it possible to have an African university in the US? or an African university in UK, if that was possible, how would that institution look like? And I say this having uh, in the space of, uh, I work at the US International University in Africa. And so I reflected deep and asked myself, we do have U.S. International University in Africa, that is in Nairobi, what is U.S. in all that, and what is African in all that? So that's the perspective on which I base my discussion with you today. So I got to some quick thinking and uh, reading that uh, brought me back to the identity. What then defines identity when I say that this university is African or when, when I say that I personally am African? And uh, got strongly convinced that really the identity in the African should not and should really not be defined by race, should not be defined by gender, religion, or our specific boundaries that bind all of us, or rather, not even ethnicity, because again, when you look at Africa and the tribes and all that, you get even to very nitty gritty details that separate brothers and sisters. So to then an understanding that it's about the philosophy, it's about the ideology. So if the philosophy and ideology is right, and that is incorporated in the state of mind, then theoretically, we can say that we can come up with an African university that has the African philosophy 
and the African ideology in it that can go and operate literally anywhere regardless of its legal registration status and all that. But delving deeper into the context, we see that the university doesn't operate in a vacuum. So even if that institution was there, it doesn't operate in a vacuum. It operates within the international concept, the global context, the regional, which is Africa now, the national, which is then the local part of it. I come from Kenya or Nigerian context must shape how that university looks like. But then, every country, if I talk about it from the national perspective, each of these countries has a way in which resources are allocated, and unfortunately, research priorities and programs offered by these different institutions have completely different pathways of achieving the impacts. What am I trying to say? If you've got the same philosophy, you could operate on the same philosophy, but pursue your own independent path of achieving the outcomes that you really need to achieve. And these outcomes, in which case, must speak fundamentally to the specific issues and the specific problems facing every society and every community in which the university operates in. I sat in a forum where we were in a group of Kenyan universities and we were saying, why are we not making solutions for the immediate problems that are facing us? And we were tasked, what is the, the vision of your university? So everyone said their vision. And then uh, we were told, also mention what makes your university unique. So everyone would say, uh, we produce the best graduates of engineering. Everyone would say. And then the, the moderator of the session said, I hoped since your university, for example, is near uh, Lake Victoria, and Lake Victoria has all problems with the, a certain weed called the health, I thought you would be saying that your university is very well known because it is the best in uh, addressing the problems of the lake. Or if you come from the dry part of the country, I thought you would say that your university is very well known because you are able to transform dry lands into uh, bread baskets and providing food for the people. That was the challenge. And this still speaks to us as we struggle with the question of what indeed is, uh, how would that African university look like? So then, this brings us to the next question of, so then what exactly would we do? And I argue that uh, we would need to break the barriers and get to a clear understanding of our philosophy and say, what philosophy and ideology do we subscribe into and run with it? If you review the models on which, for example, Christian, uni a Christian university, I put, say that in quotes, Christian university or an Islamic university runs, what are the ideologies and what are the principles on th or, uh, that such an institution runs? Without going to the merits and demerits of each, we would then say, what is the African philosophy and what is the African ideology and how can that then talk into an institution? So we would need to break the barriers and talk to the community, to the society that we do come from. And that is the only way we will be able to address and solve issues that also affect the communities at the micro level. Possibly, you could pose a ask where the, we've got all these stories about the, how the ranking of the universities in Africa and how low the rankings are, the research output is low, and all that. But then, look at the journals in which this work is published. The question is, what does it take, or why would you want to rank a university in Africa in a top journal in the US? Possibly it's just food for thought. 
And yet, if you, you send the articles there, is that article speaking to the right audience and the right forum, other than the fact that I'm so happy I've been published in a top tire journal? Let's be honest, all of us want that. So, the paradigm, what then we must also look at is who is funding the agenda of the African University. Again, I say that because whoever, who literally is calling the tune, who is asking for the tune, so who exactly is setting the agenda? I'm informed by a study I concluded in a completely different context on uh, SDGs and, and, and uh, we did a rapid needs assessment in East and uh, five countries of uh, East Africa and two in West Africa to establish the direction that uh, in, uh, different pathways for impact evaluation in the context of SDGs. And when we got to uh, discussions with scholars, many scholars acknowledged that whenever I do a proposal, I'm not responding to my needs, I'm <laughs> responding to the needs called by that paper. So I just look at the paper, I say, how do I position myself to get the funding to be able to address the issue as raised by the paper? But then you say, but hold on, isn't that the real issue that is affecting you? They say, yes, it is, but not in the context for which it is required. So I've got to do this, i be able to get funding and move on. I want to conclude by simply uh, mentioning an initiative within the Inter-University Council of East Africa that's actually taking root, uh, I, I, IUCEA, uh, that is uh, bringing about networking and a forum for discussion on higher education to be able to come up with a very specific ideology and discussion in the context of the country, and, uh, the, the, the East Africa community. So possibly, uh, a discussion on which, and I know IUCA, they were supposed to be here, but I haven't seen anyone. They were, uh, one of the issues they are struggling with is how do we get some kind of definitive explanation and ideology to say that a university within this context in this region would typically look like this? And what are these ideas that I would uh, ask all of us to possibly say what we think we must do to actualize it. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Marco? Thank you. So I would like to sit with this within the global knowledge hegemony as well as look at the historical university as such and what epistemologies can sort of define whether or not this is a university in Africa or elsewhere. I was working in a university in the UK with an elderly guy who always defined himself as a uh, belonging to the working class that he had never attended university. And so now we, we met a young man who was studying in the university. So the, the elderly man said, young man, what great country are you from? He said, Hungary. And what are you reading in this great university? The young man said, physics. And this guy I was working with, the elderly guy said, well, I belong to the university of life. I belong to the university of life. And I, I listened to that conversation between the two of them and thought that this, this man was also making sense because universities, as I understood them at the time, this kind of enclosed space. But this man was making me think that universities could affect even life, whether or not the person involved has attended a, a university. Now, and that brings me to my thinking that curiosity transcends boundaries and they can therefore foment even African epistemologies. If you look at the global knowledge hegemony, it is self-evident in uh, post-colonial contests. Though the division of intellectual labor has followed uh, in a wake of diverse di trajectories of various forms of colonialisms, 
and this is not uniform. There's a kind of discernible pattern that has emerged around the larger recognition of scholarship and where credit is, is allotted. So as such, specific division of uh, intellectual labor and the very well-defined characteristics uh, whereby credit is, for example, given to the uh, to Auguste Comte, for example, as the, the, the founder of sociology, right? Auguste Comte is the founding father of sociology because he, he coined the term so sociology. But, and then you begin to think, wait a minute, in the 14th century, there was this Islamic scholar, Ibn Khaldun, uh, who is often relegated to the footnotes in sociolo sociological scholarship. And, and this kind of deliberate you know, relegation of Khaldun, of Tunis to obscurity, points not only to the politics of knowledge, but also to the vestiges of colonialism and uh, neocolonial practices in the academy. And to that end, the great but unsung contributions of Africans home and abroad, home and in the diaspora, to the development of social thought finds a good candidate in W.E.B. Du Bois, for example, uh, in his established but little known uh, Atlanta School of Sociology, whose lim limelight was usurped by the Chicago School. My students know about the Chicago School, but not about the At Atlanta School of uh, sociology. Indeed, the politics of knowledge, which seeks to posit knowledge as a preserve of the West, was uh, exacerbated uh, by the vestiges of colonialism, as far, uh, which has far-reaching consequences in our times. And so, although the situation is changing, the dominant pattern of knowledge production continues to reflect very stratified global division of intellectual labor. So drawing on the thought process of my people, for example, I belong to a small people called the Bakbele in Ghana, I'm beginning to try to understand uh, the fact that curiosity in their way of life is a kind of resultant knowledge production that is eternally a kind of universal art of living. People think about how they live and they want to make sense of their way of life. And so curiosity may be as African as it is Western. I therefore pose the following question. So did knowledge not exist in African societies before the European expansion? Not infrequently, the oldest university in the world has been uh, misconstrued to be Bologna. Yesterday we, we heard that. That's not the case. So, and there's a guy, this Nigerian, Otite, he has counteracted the view that this, Euro, the, Euro, the university tradition on this continent is just European by pointing out that two categories of university traditions are distinguishable in Africa. The ancient indigenous African universities and the second university tradition introduced in Africa in the 19th century. So examples of the ancient universities as uh, Sue also pointed out yesterday, include the University of Karun in uh, first Morocco, established around 857, 859 AD, and Al-Azhar in Cairo in uh, 92 AD. And the University of Sankara in Timbuktu that thrived between the 13th and 16th uh, centuries until Mor the Moroccan inv invasion in uh, 1590. This should not be forgotten. The second university tradition in Africa started in the 19th century with the founding of Forabo College in 1827, and others followed. And the, these are part of the colonizing process and the European are uh, European in character. So the university is as African as it is universal. However, colonialism has dealt a huge blow to the Africanness of African, the African university particularly in view of the content of university education. So to contribute to global knowledge uh, in a unique way, the African university has to be inured with African epistemologies, even as it remains in interaction with Western or Eastern epistemologies. So here, uh, I want to draw on things I'm beginning to do, and which is where we, we met. I belong to a group 
of scholars that are beginning to think that we should deconstruct the uh, thinking that knowledge is just Western. So deconstruction, uh, reconstructing, embracing alternative ways of producing, classifying, and disseminating knowledge uh, has an African perspective. Or again, that curiosity can be the bedrock of, you know, that transcends uh, boundaries. And if you look at part of, again, where I come from, the feminine wisdom has shown that in our traditions, women have had power that in many studies in the colonial times, uh, we have been robbed of. The thinking that in Africa, in Ghana, women never had this kind of power. So in line with what you said, who says the agenda, the research agenda, the person who is funding it, or where the per person comes from? But we should think back, go back to Timbuktu, for example. Teachers, 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 you said yesterday to me. That was a tradition. Teachers making disciples leave the realm of ignorance in order to uh, run after knowledge. That's a tradition that has been on this continent. How can we benefit from you know, delving into that as well as looking into those epistemologies today that will inform how an African university can look like. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, we, we had um, um, ended on a very good note about you know, teachers uh, luring people out of, out of <coughs> ignorance. Um, and I also like the emphasis on, on, on curiosity. Um, <coughs> but let me not um, uh, speak any further. Let me hear from you, uh, Tepo. Any? Andre, Winnie. Did those places of learning self-identify as universities? Did they use that term? That's the first thing. Because the term university comes from a specific place. And this tendency to say the first university was in Timbuktu, I question that. Number two, Timbuktu, was it an African university? Or was it a Creole university? Islam at the center of its epistemology and text and so forth. What was African about it? Number three, Africa and African is an identity that was imposed on us by blood. Right? It comes from somewhere else. We didn't call ourselves African. Should we celebrate the remembering of Africa, when Africa was an identity that was, as Mudimbe shows us in the invention of Africa, imposed on us by blood. Thank you. Um, thanks, uh, Michael, Amos, and, and Viv. Uh, the Viv, first to you, I, I, want to, I want to check whether in uh, Mamdani's reflections, whether there are any ideas of moving away from the discipline, dis Western discipline-based construction of knowledge, because it seems to me that across the three presentations that knowledge seems to be the architecture of how the university evolved, and that of course to then reconstitute that one has to uh, work around um, the uh, reconstitution of knowledge uh, itself. That's the first one. Then the question around the politics of knowledge that Amos and, uh, and, and Michael mentioned. The, I'm trying to figure out uh, why is it that, uh, that a place like Kodesra seems to have moved into, have to, seems to have retreated when it comes to the knowledge production project, whilst, you know, 20-odd uh, years ago, it was a fairly vibrant space uh, for African uh, scholarship. And then, uh, Amos, you know that your vice chancellor uh, wrote a lot about um, the westernization of African studies and how African studies as a way of recuperating what is African knowledge and African epistemologies have been assimilated into a Western paradigm. 
that you can barely call African studies African studies nowadays uh, within the global space as well. So there are a number of calls about making African studies more African and of course, you know, making uh, post-colonial studies more African. You, you understand those kinds of debates and what kind of appropriations that have happened here. Now Shirley and I work on a particular thesis that the reason for that is because race, knowledge belongs to racism. That at the very moment of disciplining, ideology takes hold over knowledge. And that's why that even in African feminist studies, as, as happened in the German case, the whitening of intersectionality, intersectionality theory has more or less resulted in the way in which that particular knowledge who has had a social justice frame at his moment of birth has moved into a space of serving a particular kind of race project within, a northern, uh, uh, within the Global North uh, universities. So I'm trying to figure out what form of disciplining would be able to avoid appropriation. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I just want to contribute uh, in line with the, the Mamdani position, because I think there is this, uh, no, this position that African universities are not contributing. I don't quite fully believe in it. I think we still have to really understand how African universities are contributing. It may not be enough, but even in terms of knowledge generation, like when Mabdani writes his, I don't know whether that was the second book, uh, Scholars in the Marketplace, it, because he is critiquing the neoliberal interventions in the late 80s, 90s, uh, and that was it, itself quite a contribution in terms of waking the African states to know that something is going wrong and we are not really following our path. But I quite agree with Amos that there is no geography. Uh, the geography doesn't matter, because I know there are a number of us, some of you here, who could have studied abroad in African Studies Center or Third World Studies. They call them all sorts of things. But still, the issues which were being interrogated were issues that you know, related to the African context. And even when you look uh, in recent times, if we talk about your preamble about data and whether scholars here become research assistants, the usual debate that sometimes you end up being a research assistant as opposed to being a professor because you are working but in a very, at, at a position which is quite compromising as such because you have to do research and produce knowledge at the end of the day. But when you look at the knowledge being produced, you will find that that knowledge is still relevant to African context. We can look at SDGs. If you look at number one, nobody will say that number one is not relevant, you know, issues of poverty, education, and all that. So for me, really, if the African Union, irrespective of where it's located, if they can produce knowledge that inform issues of local context and change issues, then there won't be a big issue of whether it's Africanness or whether where wherever it is located. Um, hi everyone. I just want to thank you for three really very interesting papers. Um, I, I want to uh, just say two things. One of them is that we mustn't forget where Walt from wasn't from source, it was a Caribbean intellectual who might have worked and studied in London. Because for me, the decolonization project also comes from other places, so I just want to say that. But my other thing was thinking about your question, Amos. Is it possible to have an African university in the US? And I think that that is a really vitally important question, especially in terms of the marketization of education that we have in the, at the moment, where universities from the UK can go wherever, and from the US can go wherever and export their knowledge systems and their personnel to those zones as well, right? I think it's a, it's a really significant question also for the continuing existence of Afro-pessimism in our parts of the world, where nothing good has ever been seen to come from Africa. It's a really significant point I think you made because I rather suspect 
that if you set up an African university, say a University of Nairobi in London, the people who would go would maybe people from the continent or maybe African diasporic people might go. I don't know, but I think the brand is something that probably would not sell and it's sad to think about education in that kind of a way. Thank you. Thank you. A um, lot of food for thought and I think I really enjoyed that. Um, I want to answer the question about whether historically it was called a university and I think I want to refer to that. Uh, when I look at the Nalanda University which was established in the 5th century BC, uh, based on the explanation that was provided in the old text, it was referred to as Mahavira. That means a cluster or center of learning which is mostly monastic learning but brought in all the disciplines together. So just to put that in place in terms of what it was called at that period of time. So that's the first point of reference. The second point of reference is particularly in the context of can we have a university, an African university or an Indian university in the UK for where I come from or anywhere in the world. I would like to share an experience of uh, being in a social science conference in Berlin a couple of years ago and Catherine Hall, as you all, those who read Catherine Hall would know, Catherine had just produced her new book and she was uh, being celebrated for the book. So we were all standing there in awe of this great volume. And uh, when it came to question answers, I asked Catherine, I said, she mentioned that you know, it came to the product of a lot of students from the developing world who helped her to formulate her ideas. And I said, well, Catherine, almost all my colleagues, students, come from India to do PhDs in history in Oxford and Cambridge. How many of them actually get on to do a PhD on questions of United Kingdom or of Europe? Absolute silence. And I said, there's only one person in the history of Cambridge and Oxford who actually worked in the history of labor, who was permitted to work on the history of labor. If I were to come with all the knowledge and skills, I would not be allowed to work on those questions. So that's the second point I thought I'd just put that in front of you just to think about it. And the third part of the question that I really want you to think in terms of appropriation. I don't have the answers of appropriation that under is mentioned, but there is. I mean, I think, you know, we start, start thinking in terms of the role of intercultural dialogue. Where do you bring the intercultural dialogue, intercultural education? What sort of primacy will you give to the cultural heritage questions that we all come as part of that representation? And I think increasingly I find that when I teach, when I first started 20 years ago in Queens, I thought I would teach what I taught in Cambridge and India and everything else on urban history of urban development in India. When I came here, I realized, no, I can't teach that. I need to contextualize what I have in my knowledge for the Irish students. Okay, so there is this translational aspect which is really crucial and that language in the translational aspect is really critical. So uh, shall we do it? Yeah, let's do a reverse action, yeah. Okay, all yeah. right. So, so, so following up from what he just said, I do not think that there could be just some one discipline that would do the job. So when we talk about African epistemologists, for example, uh, I'm thinking about you know, the social worldview in which this institution is operating and this institution drawing on all these knowledges, knowledge production in this environment in order to inform uh, its audience, whoever can, comes to it. So, that's the way I, I look at it. And actually, talking about going to establish a university, an African university in London, etc. well, that has its own political reasons that why it may not succeed. But there are people from the West who are also drawn to African universities. We have many students that come to the University of Ghana for a semester, a year, and when they are going back, the, in writing, the, the kind of reports they write, you will know that their knowledge has been broadened from what it used to be. So that says something about what an, a, a university in Africa can offer uh, when, when the, the, the opportunity is right. Codestra, well, Codestra is a project, beautiful project, which was doing very well, right? Again, it comes to this 
politics of funding. Who funds Codestra? African governments, if they did more, perhaps, Codestra would be doing better. And the scholars, the scholars who, who, who have benefited from Codestra in the past, some have done tremendously in contributing to Codestra, but a good number of them have also used Codestra as a stepping stone to go elsewhere, which means that Codestra did give them some good formation. But for all obvious reasons, they just you know, uh, go elsewhere to, to, to get sort of uh, better positions. And also following up from this question of the university. So that model you talked about in India was a kind of model that operated somewhat also in Timbuktu. There were different kind of groups, different scholars that <coughs> attracted different students. So these were clusters. And that's a good model, really. Students could look for teachers they wanted to study with. <coughs> and together they did not just Islamic theology, history, archaeology, different things. If that is not a university, I don't know how to call it. Thank you so much. Amos? Uh, I will start from uh, the politics of knowledge. And uh, I want to support what Mike says, that uh, we do have others outside Africa who really, once they come in, by the time they go out, they have a complete change in mindset. And I can attest to that again uh, from where I sit because uh, we, we receive lots of international students who come from outside Africa. And when they come, uh, sometimes they are even saying, oh, I just want to test and see how this thing turns out. But they, they later undertake even uh, programs beyond their, their basic degrees within the university and we still see them saying I now want to work much more with this and this professor who is African because their minds are completely transformed. Again when we look at knowledge I share this from the perspe uh, a different perspective. If you look at what is happening to agriculture today we are now uh, as an example we are now talking about organic farming, harnessing traditional knowledge to be able to, to see whether we can produce more healthy food and all that. Where are we going? We are going back to ask ourselves what was happening before the era of pesticides and the era of the acidic fertilizers. What was happening in the same, same space. So guys are now harnessing, and, and this is true in agriculture, this is, true, it is becoming true in health, it's becoming true literally in many other fields, which then build the case for, should we go back to the roots, and how can we as universities position ourselves to have programs that actually force us to harness this knowledge and use it to solve the current problems that we are facing. On the issue of uh, westernization of African studies, I can't agree more. I've read lots of work uh, from uh, uh, the professor he's referring to. And uh, it's true. And in one of his books, he argues that um, while all these traditional, uh, while all these uh, modern methods and approaches to documenting evidence are put in place, we end up losing the, the gist of what we were initially studying. In one of the cases, he argues, how do you, for example, um, conventionalize an approach where, uh, a research approach where you are documenting a dance? If guys were dancing, and you can merely observe it right, but what was the feeling and inspiration behind the dance? So if you just come and study the dance, you will write a very beautiful story about the dance and take a video, but you lose the main essence of what was the gist and what was the idea of getting into all this. I also want to agree more with uh, Winnie about uh, it's not about geography, no boundaries, it's about making sense and being relevant as a university, which then, if I, I, I would believe that if we are relevant to Africa, then we are leaving the African university aspect. Um, I think I'll leave the rest to you. Right, thank you, Viv. Okay. 
Shirley, thanks for pointing out the Caribbean origin. I, I actually left it out of the details because I was aware of the time constraints. But I, in retrospect, I think it's an important detail that was left out. And then Andre, um, I think Mamdani sees it important to move beyond boundaries of discipline and regional or international. But uh, I, I sort of got the sense that he's arguing for the committed intellectual that he was talking about, the Darwin, um, who he identified and who's concerned with pressing in issues in one's own context. And I really don't think that we're doing this enough. We're not looking at pressing issues in our societies or even our universities. For example, in my own field of social work, which you know that I come from, um, the violence that people are living with on a daily basis in Cape Town is really not you know, on the agenda. All the effects of forced removals, for example, or intergenerational trauma of having a slave history, none of those things are on the agenda in university courses in social work. So I really think we, we need to take his call seriously. Um, I've worked at UWC for many years and I think we've done quite a lot of good sort of committed intellectual work, but we do need to look at the curricula and are we making a contribution to the, the very serious issues that we are confronted with, both locally and globally. I also think funding is a huge um, source of constraint because individualism and northern global journals are what are required in our um, funding council. If one is doing transdisciplinarity or even interdisciplinarity, you're not even on the on the, um, you know, you, you are really disadvantaged and not rewarded. So, so we need to look at how we're doing universities. Also, in terms of collaboration between universities, we in the Western Cape have been very interested in collaborating. But we find sometimes that universities are sort of, the more privileged ones aren't really interested in looking beyond themselves. They sort of, tend to be more self-satisfied. So I would challenge that too and say we really need to be collaborating across institutions, across regions, and uh, you know, not to be myopic. Um, and, and in terms of knowledges, I think reading different forms of relational ontologies, um, which are very much based on African ontologies through each other, bringing in feminist care ethics, post-human ethics, for example, all which issue individualism. I think individualism <coughs> is really a stumbling block in higher education. And also things like putting natural and social sciences together in exciting ways, using indigenous knowledges and other forms of contested knowledges. So I would say these are the sort of exciting things that we need to move forward on. Okay, great. We've got um, Michael's hand was up first. Hmm. Uh, just on a, a, a housekeeping, I, my, 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 my apologies, I should have actually um, notified the house yesterday already that the colleague from the Inter-University Council from East Africa, his, his, his uh, passport was full. So he didn't have enough space for a visa, so he had to turn back. Some, and that, sorry for that, and that's why there's a, there's a missing space here. So sorry, Chris, I should have actually asked you to, to share it. Okay, let's kick off with uh, Michael, and then... Yes, yeah, surely, absolutely. And then... Thank you. Um, I agree with the uh, most of the things that you referred to. But you know, in your arguments, you 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 concentrated on ideology, on knowledge, on context. But in terms of thinking about the African university, I agree with that. I think there there's a frame that we shouldn't forget, and perhaps I could reduce that with three words. 
um, looking to the past, looking inwards, and looking outwards. Because if we we take in those narratives that we've been hearing here from yesterday, the book launch and everything we've been talking about, we shouldn't suffer from amnesia because these African universities can reproduce all those problems. We've been educated in the UK, in the United States. And very often, the only thing we know is Foucault. <laughs> we have to do some sort of introspection. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be reproducing this colonial universe we're talking about. Our relationship to the world has changed. We have to be aware of the way this particular entity will be articulated to the world. And I think those three dimensions shouldn't, shouldn't be forgotten. Otherwise, the issues of relevance, of knowledge, won't be addressed. Sorry to speak again, I don't normally do this, but I'm quite moved by what you've been saying in a way. So I just want to say one last thing. Um, it isn't just um, the journals that you've got to publish in, but there's a whole thing about credentialism that comes from the global north, which, are, which I think has captured all of the university systems in the world. It's really true that students will get a lot when they come here to study, but notice, they come here for a semester or they come here for a year. They do not get their degree from a university in this country because they know that in terms of credentialism, where they come from, they have to get it from there. That's what I mean. That's what I was meaning about the African university in the UK or the US wouldn't work because we're still bound by these ideas about the credentials you need to have. And you know, I mean, just one last thing. I was in a former university, a Russell Group University, and I was the postgraduate research tutor for our sociology department. That meant that I had to oversee the recruitment of peers. And the university had a matrix. Where, di where in the world is this university? Right? Is it a good one or not? Yeah. Is it a private university somewhere in America that nobody has heard of, for example, or is it Stanford? Or is it the University of Lagos, that's a good one, but other Nigerian universities, not so good. You know, and, and on those kind of bases, we made decisions about who could do MAs and who could do PhDs in the UK. So all of that exists already. So that's what I'm saying, you know, there's an Im immense capture from the global north of our university system. And it would be good if people address the question of this extractive relationship, but that Winnie has also spoken about, you know, where local researchers and, and so on become actually res uh, become research assistants, actually facilitating the access of of academics from the global north, who then come and actually build whole careers. And I can actually think of a few people who've built whole careers, um, and uh, in so-called well part of this so-called team, but in terms of that of, of that uh, again that division of of intellectual labour. Uh, somebody is, is, is clearly uh, getting most, more benefit than others. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to put a disclaimer out there, unless there's an infant around, I think I'm the youngest in the room. Um, <laughs> to emphasize that, and please don't crucify me for this, I only started discovering um, the work of Foucault and Deleuze about three years ago. So I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I, I think, have the pleasure. Um, I actually don't attend Nelson Mandela University. I attend a private university, but I uh, study film. Um, so this construct and learning about this, it's a very new experience for me. But I say I have the pleasure of it because I'm kind of getting the experience that I th maybe wish that I had. But that's besides the point. Um, I would like to if possible, bring my high chair to this table of discussion um, and speak from a stance 
a standpoint of what I know and what I'm familiar with. So I'm familiar with films and deconstructing films and narratives and what's been presented to us in mainstream media. Um, I'd like to use the example of the 2018 film Black Panther. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with it as an African um, because I think people think that South African doesn't constitute you as being African in some sense as well. Um, I have a love-hate relationship because I feel that it was very much a Western romanticized idea of what Africans are or what Africans should be. Um, but I have this love connection with it because it brought about this, it re-emphasized the idea of Afrofuturism. And I think that if we can get sort of our infrastructures in the right place, that would be a very amazing direction to go into. So the reason why I'm setting this up is because there was a lot of discussion about representation and that's my main kind of study of focus study at the moment. <laughs> um, and there was a, a repetition of the thought of what do African universities look like. So I'm wondering if we can use what Black Panther has given us um, as sort of a beginning point if you see that trajectory at all possible. Thank you. All right, um, this, um, this question's for uh, Michael. Um, so my mum's Ghanaian and very often um, I ask her kind of lots of things around what, are, what does the university space look like in, in Ghana? And she's kind of given me a lot of kind of, she's preferred a lot of ideas around it that it's very different to other contexts in Africa. And I just wanted to get your perspective on what it's like at the University of Ghana, and does that differ? Does that does that differ from other African perspectives, if that makes sense? Any more questions? Anybody else that wants to make a contribution? Yeah, let's let's go back to our panelists, and then uh, maybe we'll be able to squeeze in a final round of questions. Amos, do you want to kick off? You seem raring raring to go. Uh, yes, I think uh, it's uh, first Mike's point that was uh, very passionate on ideology, knowledge, and context, which is true. Those were the three pillars on which I, I grounded my arguments. And uh, I can't agree more. And I will say something that I strongly believe in, that uh, we must, we know the right things to do, and we must do the right things. And we begin, it begins with us, it begins with ourselves, especially those of us who are endowed with leadership in the academy. We know deep insight, deep reflections, every time you make a decision, every time some of us, we just do a quick email here and you have made a decision that binds many other people in the university. The point is, let us do the right thing. If you ask many people, the issue is not knowing what is right, what is wrong. If you listen to the stories we had yesterday during the book launch, it's not like people don't know what is right. Everyone knows what is right. But why do we still continue doing the wrong things? And I'm convinced that if we live by that mantra and literally do what we are supposed to do in the rightful manner, we can be able to form that institution that we are talking about. And uh, this also, the question on credibility and different biases and whether this is a good university or not, that is very true. And we face it literally all over, even in Africa, surprisingly. Surprisingly, you will see it. Uh, I'm, in, I'm from East Africa. And uh, you sit back and you say, oh, uh, you, you are coming, this student is coming with this uh, transcript from which, university, from which country in the first place, then from which university. Maybe uh, the South African uh, uh, universities are ranked even higher. So back there you say, oh, it's from South Africa. Yes, that must be good. 
then then they, we now start by the way is are these guys is the university itself even accredited in its home country so so those biases are outright and they are right and but in my opinion where do we begin with by first of all offering the best that we can offer and believing that we have offered the best only then can i start in front of the whole world and say i have produced the best when i write that recommendation letter for a student to go and pursue graduate studies wherever i sign that with lots of confidence that i've given out the best that can come out of this specific program i choose not to get into the black panther <laughs> Uh, Viv, do you want to go next? I'm also not going to go there. But I just wanted to say that I agree with Amos. We, we really do need to find ways of doing academia differently um, in our own context and not doing violence to each other as academics, actually, and to our students. I, th I find the whole Oxbridge mode of um, critiquing and... Uh, a, quite a problematic one. And also, um, you know, this, this obsession of putting our own positions forward and hiding behind anonymity when we review colleagues. Uh, for me, they're all forms of violence, actually. Um, I, I think that we do need to find, I don't know whether it's African ways, but other ways of relating as academics and relating to our students. Well, Michael. Thank you. On, on the question of the Black Panther, I would say whatever is good from anywhere that can be drawn on to help anybody, that should be considered. That's all I can say generally. So you may have knowledge systems from the global north, knowledge systems from Africa. Why? They should be in interaction with one another. At the independence in, in Ghana, our first president, Nkrumah, realized that, and we, we still know that today, there are more African studies departments in one country, the United States, alone, than the whole of this continent. And so he made it his project that Ghana should have one of the best African studies centers in the world. That was a huge project he committed himself to. We're still working at it. We're still working at it. So, whatever is good from anywhere, let's draw on it. And Michael, yes, the point you made sort of sits very well with me, which is the reason why I'll go back to try to look at what I consider uh, university traditions in the past, what we have now, and also what is out, that we are always in conversation, drawing on good models, good models, everywhere uh, could, be, could, could be very helpful. And, and that should lead us maybe into thinking of more partnerships, more collaboration, even on the continent. Why is it that uh, I send my students from Legon to um, European countries to spend a semester, but it doesn't work? I haven't tried that yet with other African countries like South African universities. That's something we have to begin to think of. And there are ways to get around this model. Because even with some of the, 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 the universities in the global north, what we do, you pay your local fees there, our students pay their local fees, and when there's an exchange, the students don't exchange fees. And you come, there's the space, whatever you want to study, you come, the space is for you. What's your name again? Jason. Jason. The University of Ghana is a beautiful place. There are many people here who have been to, who have been to Legon. You want to come to Legon and spend, and spend a semester. It's part of the, the European tradition I was talking about in the 19th century. It was formed in 1948, right? At the point when there was this huge debate, the British were, were on the verge of leaving, and they wanted to give the West African region one university. So the debate was whether it should be in Ibadan, People were sort of scrambling that you go to Makerere, and we wanted one in Legon. In the end, they had to open up, and those three universities resulted. So there's sort of there's some kind of synergy in, in them from the beginning. 
And, and Legon, well, was created along the, it was affiliated to the University of London, but modeled on the Osbridge tradition. So when you come, you still have the old halls with their chapels and halls of residence, tutorial system, etc. much of which, which has crumbled a bit, but we are still building on that past also for the future. Thank you. We do have uh, time for another round, so. Thank you very much for this wonderful conversation. A, a quick question. Um, it, it, um, it comes out of three, three fragments that was, uh, the one was the point about Dubois, the other one was the point sort of here about Timbuktu, and the other one was about Ibn Khaldun. Yeah. And I sort of have been tracking each of those three, um, historiographically at least. And it alerted me to the, to the question of historicization, methodologically. Yeah. So that these concepts are brought to life conceptually, uh, beyond sort of, sort, of, sort of a space of a rhetorical enunciation. They put it to use. So I, I'm asking you about the concept of question of historicization. I want to speak about uh, film. I'm, I'm not trained as a, an art critic, but I write about film once in a while when I move to do that. I do kind of film critique and, and art critique because uh, I enjoy it. And, um, and I wish I was trained in that way. Film is powerful. I mean, film is one of the most powerful things, uh, carriers of values and how to see, which is my thing right now. Um, and I'm, I'm punting uh, f a few weeks back, Eusebius McKayza of, of Radio 702 invited me and, um, and Leto Honono Mahorwane to talk about the way they see us, the Central Five part, because I, I needed to, to, have, to offer my, 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 my critique and, and to talk about wonderful film, the way it's short, and I watched the earlier film that was done, done on them. So come back to Black Panther, which I've also spoken about elsewhere. I mean, visually, it's an amazing, it's a striking film, right? Uh, the clothes, and they have the blankets, which I have at home, um, by the way. My, I'm, I was given them by my grandmother. Uh, they're, they're fantastic. Of course, they're, they're, they're produced by Aranda, Aranda in Cape Town. Um, uh, for 3,000, you get 10 of those. But they, they sell quite a lot of money at, uh, at tourist shops. They get the blankets. They get the Susutu quite right, by the way, sometimes. They get really right. Uh, and there's this John Carney right there, wonderful. And then, you know, all of that. And, but there's this part about, about what money does, of course, in, in the world of film. And I, I was listening to a, a, an interview last week about a film that's going to be made of Harriet Tubman, I think it is. About the money is American, the actress is, is British, and she says, I'm going to read about it, and the American, the African Americans just flipped. Says, no, you know wherever you are. So money is an important part about who, who directs, who shoots the film, and what we see. Uh, and of course, there's a set, all of that. So in one sense, you're quite right. I mean, Black Panther, I take my son to, to, to the film, and, and I, uh, this is the second time. Of course, first time I watched it on, on whatever. <laughs> and again, on a big screen, and he, uh, it's, he's younger than the, the required age, but I say, you have to see this. And he comes out, he is just like a, you can see the electricity in him. He says, uh, this is a, a boy who's gonna live with misrecognition in his life. He's a black looking boy who doesn't speak an African language, who speaks English. His mother tongue is English, but he looks black. So he's gonna live with this. And I, what people insist now that he should have a father's tongue. I think, why especially me? Because although I've tried this, he says, I've never seen blackness like this. I wanna be this black. I say, there's a lot of blackness that you don't know about, son. Because <laughs> I teach him all the time. That the, the, there's blackness, and there's blackness, there's blackness. And so in the music, in the film, I say, I, he, he watches Wiz Khalifa. He listen to Wiz Khalifa. He says, this is the blackness I want, Wiz Khalifa. He says, hang on with the tattoos, boy. But anyway, the point is how powerful that impacted him, right? But the, the problem is, 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 this is Africa seen from elsewhere. That's it. That's the key. So you have to go up to uh, Sember Osman and right back in the films. You have to watch African film. What? So because film, when you have a camera, I mean, people will tell you, if you have a camera and somebody comes and sees it, then you don't know this, right? 
they see what you see, what you want them to see. That's the key. And Black Panther so does this something wonderful. At the same time, it tells you, we have to have more filmmakers, young filmmakers. We have to have directors. We have to have money people putting money. And that is how you're going to colonize, if you wish, Mars. Not America, Mars. Because then you will have put a certain perspective into place that's African, uh, in the sense of African being a, a situatedness in a certain place, right? Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Any last, 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 but very, very short, um, and then we're going to give it back to our panel panelists to, to wrap up for us. Okay. Um, hi again, everyone. Um, during the book launch, um, it was said that your silence won't save you. So this is me breaking the silence. <laughs> so um, I'm currently um, researching on African democracies and constitutionalism. And usually I like writing comments, but I thought let me just read this one as well for the purposes of this discussion. So um, when democracy slowly invaded the African government system, more focus was on individualism as a liberal element. Thus, we lost communitarianism in, in Africa. So my question is, how do we then build African regional communitarianism when we still have colonial boundaries resisting African movements? Is there a way to deal with the invisible legacy of colonial boundary system so as to reinstill communitarianism in Africa and in African universities? Okay, good. Now back to our panelists. Um, you really have about I'd say about three minutes each to, to share your final thoughts with us. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you very much. So yes, I'm I'm still reading, sort of finding out about Haldun, and I do know that uh, as an Islamic scholar in Tunis, from Tunis, he uh, wrote a lot about this society, even the kind of agricultural practices that they they engage in, 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 in that society. And talk about du, Bo, du Bois or Du Bois. You know, the whole question about racism, which he had to confront, you know, head on. He was perhaps, at that time, the first person within the confines of his Atlanta school and the, the, the kind of methodology he employed, sending out people to collect data, etc., was able to write that actually racism was a, was a, a social con construction rather than a biological question. So that's, that's a very l l landmark kind of um, uh, sort of achievement of, of du, du, du Bois. So this thing sort of influenced uh, what we want to do, uh, the kind of knowledge systems we want to draw on in order to build on a better future. Now, I said to you that Andrea and I are trying to create a borderless world, right? <laughs> well, the colonial boundaries are still there, but Africa has moved on. We, we, we have not been static. static. Even with the African Union, with all that we haven't been able to achieve yet, the barriers are breaking gradually. Uh, about three years ago, Ghana said, all Africans who want to travel to Ghana can get their visa on arrival. That's fantastic. A few African countries can exchange visits now without visas. And now even South Africa has announced, to, to, to my great gratitude, that very soon, between Ghana and South Africa, you know, there will be no visas. We're making progress, aren't we? We can build on that in order to strengthen uh, our societies and our universities as such. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Amos? Thank you. Okay, thank you for, for that. I think uh, in terms of uh, breaking, the, that is uh, the, the discourse between individualism and uh, communitarianism. Can the audience just give our panelists their final word? Thank you. In the context of uh, all the historical boundaries and the colonial boundaries that exist, I think the first thing is a mindset change where you simply figure it out. There is no boundary within the mindset. And I'll give this through a specific case. We run a network of professionals, those of us, uh, we are Africans and we happened to have 
go, to have done some program at uh, the University of California in Berkeley. And what we did is we came back. Uh, the dream was started by three of us. I chair the, uh, the whole thing. And uh, currently we are about 28. And what we decided to do is to mentor young scholars and others with the specific ideologies on working on specific projects in Africa. So what I'm telling you is what we did is first of all to break the, the, the boundary, the physical boundaries and have that mindset that I'm working with, the, I'm Kenyan, but I'm working with a, a young Tanzanian somewhere, I'm working with a young Ghanaian somewhere. Um, so, so within the, this whole framework, I share my views and I, and I get them oriented in, in towards the kind of thinking that uh, we would want to have. This era, through the technology, because of technological breakthroughs, then we are able to achieve a lot, even when the physical boundaries still subsist. And uh, I think I'll stop there, but I also want to announce that uh, we also work very closely with the University of Ghana. And uh, this October, we are holding a biennial uh, conference on Africa studies, ASA. Anyone familiar with ASA? Yes, yes. We are hosting it in October in Nairobi. I think it's, uh, I can't remember, 19th to around, it's some, sometimes in, I, I can share the details. We are hosting it and uh, the beauty of it is that I'm, I'm, I'm in the lead of the whole of the, the group that's doing that. And uh, so Ghana will be in Nairobi in October and the whole of Africa. <laughs> so I'll be sharing more details. Sounds fantastic. Um, yes, Viv. Yeah, just to say, um, technology is making things possible. We had a very excellent course on women's health and well-being, and it was across the University of West Indies, Makerere, and my university, and Maryland. And people learned a whole lot about specific issues by looking at policies in their own context. So I think technology is making things possible. One doesn't also have to physically travel, although that also helps. But I just wanted to end off by saying that I've learned so much on this panel and I really enjoyed being on it. So thank you very much. Please uh, let's give them a good round of applause. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Christy and colleagues. Um, colleagues, we're going to have some tea now. Just to, sorry, just to ask. Um, if we can return back here a little bit earlier at four o'clock for the reflections, a little bit earlier than the program. Um, I mean, at three, where are we? Wait a second. Yeah, 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 no. After tea, we're going to shorten the length of the reflections um, and then head off by shuttle to where the book launch will be. But we're heading a little bit earlier, hopefully via the NMU shop so that people can have a look and get some nice NMU merch for those who are interested. Some of us really are. Um, and then we'll head off to the book launch. Please, the book launch I think is going to be spectacular. It's going to be very interesting to hear. Um, and then we've shifted some things for tomorrow. Um, there's a sense that people are tired, that the conversations that will happen tonight will be rich and late and over good food and wine. So tomorrow morning, we were thinking to start at 10 o'clock. Please, we would like to assert that yeah, yeah, all the conversations that we've been having that have come back to the issues that will be discussed tomorrow are important enough to not then sleep too late past 10 or to go shopping. Please, particularly our foreign visitors, do not go shopping tomorrow and miss the discussion on race, gender, and all of that that's in the three dots. Okay. You, you are visible now, and we will see if you are here tomorrow. So please, hop, please, the shuttle will be leaving at half past nine, and the session will start, yeah, tomorrow morning, will start at 10. Okay, see you all for the reflections in a bit.